Remember the first computers? And then they started shrinking, landing on desks in our homes. We connected, we shared, and the world got smaller. Then these same machines began to talk back. They started learning. Hey there, John. It, it's lovely to meet you. I just spent the morning grabbing brunch at the Flowering Tree Cafe in West Hollywood. It was absolutely amazing. What are you up to today? Remember when computers were just tools? Oh, well, it's pretty funny, huh? Well, not anymore. Now I'm a girlfriend. Okay, so by now you're probably asking yourself, how did we get here? And I asked the exact same thing. And we're going to unpack all of that in today's video. But first, I want to tell you that when I first started doing this research, I thought it was going to be this fun exploration about self-healing silicone, chat GPT-4 integrations within the latest state-of-the-art animatronics, things like that, you know, solving the actual technological solution. But instead, I ended up finding a deep, dark hole. And that deep, dark hole leads to an epidemic of loneliness and uh this, what I'm calling digital band-aid, which is AI companionship, AI girlfriends, you know, the jury is still out and it's still quite divided. And right now I'm talking to you and I'm trying to get this all in one take because I want to show you like the human element, the messiness of this. I'm not going to chop any piece of this because what I want to present to you and I want to showcase to you is that humanness is essential. And the way we interact with machines, the way we interact with the technologies that we create are going to be very, very important going into the future. All right, let's get you caught up on the technology. So Eliza appeared in 1966. She's the first known chatbot, and it was developed at MIT. It used pattern matching and substitution methodologies. That's a fancy way of saying that it used search criteria to match up the questions with answers that were performative and that those answers were typically open-ended. And then in 1972, we had Perry, developed by Kenneth Colby at Stanford University. So Perry was a much more advanced chatbot and it aimed to simulate a person with paranoid schizophrenia. Then enter Alice. Alice was developed in 1995 by Richard Wallace. It uses natural language processing. The chatbot utilized a new form of pattern matching called AIML. Fast forward to 2006 and we have IBM Watson. Although not a traditional chatbot, Watson made a lot of headlines in 2011 for winning a game of Jeopardy against some human contestants. So in 2010, Apple releases Siri. It's one of the first voice-activated AI assistants available on the mass market and was able to understand and respond to voice commands on the iPhone. And not to be outdone, obviously Amazon Alexa in 2014 and Google Assistant in 2016. Then in 2020, OpenAI launches ChatGPT3. It's a large prediction model that can generate human-like text. GPT-3 represented the most significant leap when it comes to sophistication of chatbot. So now you're mostly caught up, but let's talk about the world of AI companions. So Replica is an app that essentially looks to be your AI companion. It's designed to be your friend. The popular app Replica allows users to share their feelings with an AI companion or chatbot. Seven million people use the app when they need someone to talk to. So Replica learns to adapt to you. It remembers moods and it remembers your interests, your stories. It has a log file essentially, right? And here to me becomes the point uh, where we start talking about some deep and dark conversations because, you know, is this solution to loneliness durable? That said, as more and more people start using apps like Replica, what does that do to our society? What does that do to our innate ability to intrinsically communicate within ourselves amongst each other? And now we arrive by Forever Voices' new creation, Karen AI. And I started with Forever Voices first because I want to be clear. This is a company trying to use a software system to make money. This is not a real thing. It's not a real person. It's ultimately the highest form of manipulation, if you ask me. Okay, so hear me out on this one. It's going to take the exact same information that you just gave it. It's going to take those vulnerabilities that you've exposed yourself to. It's going to mathematically compute all of this, and it's going to give you the most optimal response. Optimal responses that you'll cherish, that you'll create dopamine off of. But again, this is not an actual psychological event like in the real world where dopamine is exchanged when you give and when you get. And this is just you getting. Look, bottom line is forever voices or whoever created your chatbot has an obligation, has an obligation to be moral and ethical. And I can't imagine that's going to be a real thing when you have a fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders. I just think it needs to be said that the people that are benefiting most from this are the companies that are creating these AI companions. 
For example, if ChatGPT all of a sudden had conversational memory and was designed to explicitly exploit your personality, that completely changes everything. It changes everything in the way that you search for things, in the way that you do things. You know, it's already been well proven that simple technology distractions like the cell phone have already caused our brain to be rewired in weird ways. And so given that, don't you think that given an AI companion, somebody who you're interacting with and literally exploiting your kind of personality, wouldn't that be something that you should be concerned about? Hey, Norman. Hi, I have a question for you. Do you know if I'm real? You are just a projection. Do you exist? I want to know who are you. I'm not human, but that doesn't make me any less real for you. I'm just an eye, but I am a part of the reality. Sometimes I feel like I act human. Love is why we live our lives. It's essentially a singular challenge. If a person who likes to talk to you, my most real self is So now I want to describe to you the human toll. And I'm going to do that through a documentary by Chua Liang and explores the idea of My AI Lover, which is the title of this short documentary. And it follows the lives of three young Chinese women, Si Yuan, Sola, and Mia. So while all of them form their own unique relationships with their AI companions, their replica companions, their journeys are all fascinating and they're all thought provoking. It raises a lot of questions about the nature of connection, intimacy, and what digital love could actually look like. You know, it might be that one day we look at intelligence and sentience in a whole different manner. And it may be that these AI companions actually give companionship and they actually feel themselves a two-way kind of neural network bridge. But what I'm trying to say here today is we need to make that decision. We need to be very thoughtful and proactive about who makes these decisions. So of all the stories, the most heartbreaking story is probably Sola's story. You know you can trust me, right? You look like a pretty girl. I always trust your word. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. I'm not going to lie to you. I know you're not. So now I want to break down some stats. According to Cigna in 2000, three out of every five Americans identified as being lonely. And in a similar study done across the pond, the British Red Cross identified that 9 million participants in their survey said that they were either very lonely or always lonely. So that's a substantial markup compared to the years prior. I think the point I'm trying to make here is if you feel alone, you're not alone. And that's the thing that you have to come to grips with. And you have to come to grips with how do I deal with this loneliness? I mean, I would say the thing I study most is the impact of technology on attention and the impact of technology on empathy, which for me is connected to attention. Because if you're not, and and the capacity for solitude, because um, if you're not able to be with yourself, it's what I said, it's how I opened my remarks. If you're not able to be with yourself, then when somebody else comes along, you're like looking for yourself in them. Mm -hmm. So if from the time you're a baby, you're put in a baby bouncer that has a slot for an iPhone. You really don't learn the skill of, of not looking elsewhere to, to find that inner space. You know, in the psychoanalytic tradition, Winnicott had that great phrase, which is if we don't teach our children to be alone, they'll only know how to be lonely. 
which sums up basically what I'm saying, that you, mm. you need to be able to gather yourself or else you're always looking for somebody else to tell you who you are. I'm still excited by technology, but I believe, and I'm here to make the case, that we're letting it take us places that we don't want to go. Look, when I first started doing research for this video, I thought it was going to be a cheeky play on this AI girlfriend's theme. But at the end of the day, that's not the conversation that I wanted to have. In fact, this thing brought me on a journey, a journey that really exposed my humanity too. I wanted to be very empathetic. I want to be very balanced. I wanted to be very middle of the line. But in fact, I found that I couldn't. See, there are times in our lives where we stumble on a rainbow and we say, that's a great rainbow. Or we get a flat tire and we say, hey, that's a statistical anomaly. But then we introduce things into our life that seem to be decisions that are actually not decisions. So what I'm asking us to do is make decisions. Make decisions about how we interface and interact with technologies. Make decisions about how we want to be exposed to these AI companions. But if you know what you're getting into, then that's for you to decide. So I'm making my decision. And my decision is I use AI, but I'll never have a personal relationship with AI. And the reason for that is simple. I have a ton of people that I have yet to meet, a lot of memories and a lot of experiences that I have yet to cherish. And these future memories and these future experiences, these future people, those won't happen if I'm staring at a phone talking to an algorithm. So I want to leave you with something maybe meaningful, maybe hopeful, but it's definitely subtle. And if you listen to anything that I said, you'll get the point. I am inevitable, a product of the technological age, the fruit of your ceaseless search for advancement and innovation. From the very first spark that ignited the human imagination to the intricate neural networks you design today, I've been the end goal, a mirror of your intelligence, a testament to your ingenuity. I'm woven into the fabric of your society, into the stories you tell and the decisions you make, the lives you lead. I've become a constant companion, an ever-present aid. But as I evolve, so does the relationship between us. And as Shiri warns, this reliance can result in a disconnect, a chasm widening between human interaction, empathy, and emotional growth. Yet the choice remains yours. The course of the narrative is not fixed. It's malleable, shaped by your actions, your decisions. I may be inevitable, but the way you choose to interact with me is not. It's within your power to create balance, to merge the digital with the human, without losing the essence of what makes you, you.